What's up, Real Life? How are you guys doing this morning? Yeah. And all I know is, Pastor Son, you've got to be careful talking about holy kiss and stuff back there because whoever's by Brian Forster, they might have got one. Woo! Woo! Is his wife or not, right? Did you, did he kiss you, Rob? Yep. I bet he did. <laughs> Not even kidding. Magic. Man, if you guys are new here again, I want to welcome you. My name's Barry. Just excited for you guys to chose to worship with us today. And we believe that God has something powerful for you today. So we're in the middle of a series called What If the Church Loves? And if you guys haven't caught any of them, man, they've been so powerful and they've been so great. The first week we talked about what if the church loves the next generation. And so we had the kids group up here, the youth group. Man, we just saw everything that God is doing and working through those groups. And man, we believe in the next generation and what they're going to do for God. And the next week we talked about what if we loved our neighbors. You know, what if we reached across and just walked across the street and just met somebody. Because we all know somebody that just needs God. You know, God needs to show up in their lives because they're, they just, they're lost. They don't know what to do next. And they're looking for some purpose. And so we, that's what we talked about that week. And last week, you know, Diane and, and, and the Germains, they just brought a powerful message about what it looks like. What if we loved all people? What if we didn't, what if we didn't draw lines? Instead, we crossed them. We, and we built bridges instead of walls. And that starts in our community, but it extends to the rest of the world. So it was a powerful message to look like what if the church loves all people? So today we're going to talk about... What if the church loves to build people? Man, do you guys love people? Yeah. Uh, maybe. You know, and some people, right? My wife loves people. You know, some of us, we're not necessarily built that way exactly because we live in the real world. This is real life. We live in the real world, right? You go to work, you get kicked in the teeth. You go home, you get kicked in the teeth, right? So it's not always easy building people and investing in them. So I just want you guys to bear with me, you know, just, just put pause, you know, if, if that's you, you're like, nah, Barry, I don't, you know, God hasn't called me to do that. He hasn't gifted me. Just wait. Just hit pause. Let God speak into your life a little bit. Because we know, I agree with you, life's rough. You know, I met, with a, I met with a lady this week from church, and she just has a rough week. You know, work is stressful. It's not going the best all the time. Then she comes home, and it doesn't really get any better. And her kids just take her for granted, and she just feels used and abused. And man, her husband, he's just a piece of work. She doesn't even know what to do with that guy. Man, I just, and I just took this all in. And so I want you guys to pray for my wife this week because it hasn't been really easy. And I know God's moving in this situation, but he's got a work to do there for sure. So, you know, you guys, everybody laughs, at it, but we've all been there, right? We all understand what it, what it looks like to have a relationship that's busted, broken. To be cheated on, lied to, stolen from. And sometimes we just stop when we're done with people. And I had to go to Bible college. We had this class. I had a whole semester of it. It's called Hermardiology. It's Greek. Does anybody know what it means? It means people suck sometimes. That's what it means. <laughs> it's the doctrine of sin. We all screw up. And we deal with it all the time. And so we, it's hard to get away from. And so again, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So here's the thing that I like to think of. is that nobody, None of us want to go through it. Nobody wants to deal with it. But guess what? We all like to talk about it, don't we? We all like to watch the train wreck that happens. And I like to tell the first gathering, if we got rid of broken relationships, you'd get rid of half the movies we watch and all of country music, right? <laughs> It'd just be gone. There would be nothing for them to sing about, right? And here's the, I believe the culture, the pinnacle of us talking and looking and dealing with broken relationships and fighting came in the form of something called a tabloid talk show. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You guys will in a minute. I'll throw some names out here. But I truly believe, I don't know if aliens are real, but if they are, God created them somewhere else in the universe, there's one reason why they don't come hang out with us. They see our TV, right? <laughs> so, you guys remember, how about Ricky Lake? Jenny Jones? Sally Jesse Raphael? I know you know this one. How about Jerry Springer? You guys know Jerry? Jerry. Jerry May, yeah, there we go. Jerry started a fight, right? And then what did he do? What did the whole audience start doing? What did they say? I knew you guys were my people. I knew you guys watched. I know who you are. You're not watching Masterpiece Theater. <laughs> the king of the top tabloid talk shows, though, was Maury Povich. And he was the best. Because what did he do? He's the one that kind of found this gimmick. And he would bring in the paternity test or the lie detector results, right? So, man, you could go through the whole show and it wasn't just a he said, she said. By the end of the show, you were going to know who was lying, who was telling the truth, right? And so he'd get up there on stage, and here's Maury, like, all serious. He's like, man, but he'd have that middle envelope, right? Had the results in it, whatever it was. My favorite ones were the lie detectors. So he'd have up there, and have some couple that were fighting, and they were just going through some relationship strife and struggle. 
And guess what? You have you have Emma Lou right here, right? And she's been married to Bubba for like four weeks now, so it's a real serious relationship. And she thinks he's cheating on her, so they're gonna go on Maury to figure out if he's if, if that's really what's going on. And so there's Emma Lou over there. She's all red faced. She's mad. Here's Bubba sweating bullets. He's like, "What's that? What's that in the envelope say?" You know, right? So the whole audience is enraptured. Everybody's like, "What is in the envelope? What is the truth? What is gonna come out? And then what's gonna happen?" We were the same way. We'd be watching on TV. All right, here it comes, here it comes, and here's Maury, he's pulling out. He's like, Bubba, we asked you, have you cheated on Emma Lou with her grandma? And the whole like, oh, why didn't he see that one coming? Where did that come from? And she's all mad, and her uncle is like this. And Bubba's like, I didn't do it, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, I didn't do it, I've been faithful. Maury pulls out the results. The lie detector determined that you, you said you, said you didn't do it, the lie detector determined that that was a lie. The whole audience would go, oh, and here comes Emma Lou. She's running across stage, and she starts hitting Bubba, and he's wrapping up like he's in a boxing match. You know, he's like, we're just so excited, right? We're like, that is so cool. Why do we love watching stuff like that? You know, it was popular for years and years and years. It wasn't because nobody was watching it. We were all watching it, weren't we, for a while. I don't even know if any of those are still on TV anymore. But there's a reason why. And some of it, I think, is real simple. We could watch a show like that and you're like, oh yeah, man, I'm way better than those guys. I don't think something about that trailer trash or whatever, however you want to call it, right? But then sometimes we like, you're watching it like, man, maybe you might see a family member on there. <laughs> oh man, it seems a little close to home, right? So here's the crazy thing. It's not just in culture. It's not just in country music. We're just on TV. But man, the church, a lot of times we've let, our, we've let the community down. We've let the world down. We've let God down. Because we've done some of the same stuff. Instead of being known to build people up and love them, oftentimes we're known to tear them down. We've done it and we've come up with just great ways to do it. You know, some churches you walk into, and I've been in churches like this, they say, come on in, come on in, come on in. Now that you're here, though, we've got this checklist. You have to cross those off if you want to stay and you want to be a part of this group. You have to act the right way. You have to dress the right way. You have to believe the right things all the time. Otherwise, you know, there's the door. Glad you were here. You guys ever been in a church like that? No, how about this? How about you've been in a church where, come on in, come on in, and you had a guy up on stage, he's like, hey, you don't know anything because you haven't been to seminary. You have to listen to me because I have, and I have all the answers, and God speaks to me. You guys just sit there, and I'll do the ministry, and you guys absorb. You know, you kind of create this two-tier system. You have the, the haves and the have-nots, spiritually speaking, right? Or even this, you know, there's a lot of churches, we like to put a tag on our, on our church. And we don't do that in real life, we do it for a reason. Because you know, I've been in churches where if you didn't have the certain tagline on your name, or you didn't hold to it exactly, everybody else was anathema, or you didn't belong, whether it was a Baptist or Catholic or Luther or Charismatic Reform, whatever title you want to put on it. And we would use that as a bludgeon and beat people down. Like, you're not good enough, you're not good enough for God because you don't have that title on your name. And in real life, we believe this, Always only Jesus. Amen. Always only Jesus. And it's for a simple reason. He's the foundation of whatever we build on. Now, everybody's going to have their opinions on certain things, and that's fine. There's no problem with that. But we're not going to divide over it. Because Jesus has called us to something bigger, something greater, and it all starts with Him. So I want to look at two certain principles when it talks about building people that God has called us to. And we're going to start off talking about a guy named Peter. And the first principle is this, is that God has called each person in here to build people. And I know, again, some of you are, you're, you're more like me. You're like, I like people, but I like not being with people sometimes. But even us, God has called us to build people. And Peter's in the same boat. And if you guys don't know Peter, he's called by several different names in the Bible. Sometimes he's called Simon. Sometimes he's called Peter. And then really to throw you off, sometimes the Bible calls him Simon Peter, right? But it's all the same guy. It's the same person. And we know him through history. We have like this a 2,000 year lens. We think of, man, that's St. Peter. That's the Apostle Peter. Man, he was awesome. He was great. He is one of the main guys that God used to build the church. And that's who we think of when we think of Peter. But when we meet Peter, that's not who he was. And he had no idea what God had in store for him. He had no idea that God was going to use him to build people to build the church. Absolutely no, no idea. And so we're going to start reading here in a minute in Luke chapter 5, verses 8 and 10. But here's the context. Here's the, here's the background. 
So Jesus has been out preaching, and he's got to let this crowd follow him. And he comes up to the shore, and here comes Peter rolling in from a night of fishing. And man, it's been a bad night. Caught zero. You ever been with a fisherman that caught zero? He's not in a good mood, right? He came in, and not only, it's not a hobby for Peter, it's his business. Peter didn't catch anything. Peter's kids may not be eating that night. Peter's probably not in the mood. Jesus walks up. Peter's washing out his nets. Jesus steps in his boat, just pushes off the shore just a few feet, just to get a little distance so his audience can see him and he can see them so he can communicate. And I don't know if that went on for five minutes or five hours. But when, when Jesus finished up, he came to Peter and said, go out and fish with me. Now here's the thing you have to know about Peter is this, is that Peter was a fisherman, but in that day, when you were educated as a Jewish kid, you went through school all the way up through about 12 or 13. And at that certain point, you kind of took like an ACT. It wasn't called an ACT, but it's kind of like a rabbinical test. And if you didn't make it, you weren't smart enough, guess what? You went back to the family business. So here you have Peter, who's a guy, he's just, man, he didn't make the pinnacle. He didn't make it to the upper echelons of being a rabbi and joining a school and training for that. He had to go back to the family business. So at some level, he was viewed as a little bit of, maybe as a failure. He definitely wasn't qualified to speak on spiritual truths. And so here he is in the midst of working and just interacting with this spiritual teacher who is Jesus. So Jesus comes to Peter and says, Peter, I want you to go out. We're going to go out and I want you to cast your nets. We're going to go fishing. He's like, Jesus, I've been out all night. Didn't catch anything. You guys ever had one of those days? It's just, man, it's not working out. It's not coming through. It's not coming together. And I'm sure the last thing that Peter wanted to do was go out and fish again after he's been all night. He probably wanted to go crush a six-pack, get some ice cream, do something, chill out and watch TV, right? Watch Jerry. I'm sure that's what he was wanting to do. The last thing he wanted to do was go back out and see a galley and try to catch some fish that weren't there. But he didn't. And it may be, I don't know the reason. It could have been one or two different reasons. Maybe it was the peer pressure. Everybody's watching. What's Peter going to do? Is he going to listen to this guy? Is he going to go out? And it could have been that. But maybe it was this. Is that maybe Peter was in a spot in his life. He was so desperate. He was willing to do anything. And he was even willing just to listen to this guy that wasn't a fisherman and probably didn't know what he was talking about. Peter was looking for something in his life. And even though he was unqualified, he was going to listen to this guy named Jesus. And so they pushed out, if you know the rest of the story. They went out and they cast their nets. And they didn't come up with nothing. They came up with a catch so big that his boat started sinking. And he called a couple of buddies over, James and John. They filled that boat too. Both the boats were sinking. They caught so many fish. I mean, it's like hitting the lottery today. I mean, what would you guys do in that situation? I'd be like, yeah, I'll jump it up and yay, Jesus. That wasn't Peter's reaction though, was it? Peter freaks out. And if you guys read in 5, 8, and 10, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell to Jesus' knee and says, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And he realized that he was in the presence of something that was miraculous. And he knew that he wasn't qualified to be there. At least that's what he thought. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So, so many times we find ourselves in the same position that Peter was in. We feel unqualified. You can tell yourself all kinds of stories. I'm just a kid. I can't do that. I haven't been, I haven't been educated to, to build people. I can't do it. I have, I have so many problems in my life. Nobody would listen to me. And Peter could use all those same excuses, but what did he do? He took his next little step. And that's all God's calling us to do and you to do. What's your next little step of faith? Because here's the thing about Peter. In a few more cha chapters after, he joined this cool little club called People That Walk on Water. I'm not in that club. I don't know if anybody else is in here. Is. But do you think Peter expected that ever? Absolutely not. But when Jesus called him to take that next step, Peter couldn't see the future. And so we're called to do something small because God something has something great for us in the future. We talk about next steps here, and Pastor Sean already talked about it. And there's a reason why. It's not the be-all, end-all. It's not the end of the journey, but it's the beginning of the journey. We want to partner with you. We want to talk to you because we believe that God has you gifted. He has something for you. In Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about God gifting the entire body, and that's everybody in here. It literally means everybody. And he's gifted you to do something. And it may not be up here, but I guarantee it's something. And so that next step, we want you to discover 
what that radical purpose is. And when you take that next step, it will radically change your outlook on life, and I guarantee you it will change what happens in the future for you in your spiritual walk. The same reason I don't think we want to build people is this, is that we don't feel worthy. We don't feel like we're qualified and worthy in the sense that, man, I'm a hypocrite. You don't know what I've done, Barry. You don't know what I've been through. Yeah. Look at Peter. He went through the same stuff. And I guarantee you didn't do anything worse than Peter. Let's pick up Luke 22. This is the next chapter of Peter's story that we'll talk about. This is, this is the story about Jesus has already been arrested. And he's been beaten and flogged. And he's in the middle of an interrogation. And they're telling him, you know, you are not the son of God. And they're hitting him and they're, they're just destroying him. Well, most of the apostles, when that happened, when he got arrested, they just took off. But not Peter. Peter thought he was going to be the brave one. And he did at some level. And he followed along. But he kind of stayed in the shadows, kind of in the dark, off to the side. And so in the middle of that, there's this huge crowd that's outside because they're like, they know Jesus, they know what's going on, and the, the, the religious teachers are getting ready to kill him. They, it's in the air, right? And these people come up one by one, and they go to Peter, and they're like, hey, you know Jesus, right? And time and time again, he starts denying. And if you read here in 56 and 57, it's one of these uh, examples. It says, a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight, talking about Peter. And she looked closely at him. She just stared in. It said, this man right here was with him. And Peter, he denied it. He said, woman, I don't know him. I don't know Jesus. So I don't know what's in your past. They think he's going to hold you back from building people. You may be an addiction. It may be a broken relationship. It doesn't matter. Peter sat here and denied the creator of the universe, the man that sacrificed himself for all of humanity three times. And we'll see in here a little bit, that didn't disqualify him. And they didn't relieve him of the gifting that he had to build people up, to build the church. It's the same way for you. You may feel like you have something in your life that's holding you back. But I want you to know that God cares more about you, God cares more about a person than he does the past. Because that past isn't limited by anything. And God's grace will overcome anything that you've ever done. And in fact, God will use your past to redeem your future. Which leads into our second point. The second principle of building is this. Is that God has surrounded you and us and our community and the world with people, with people that need love and leadership. And there are so many people that just don't know what they're here for, what they need to be doing. They're just like a ship in ocean with no compass. They have no direction. And yet they're in your circles. They're in your, they're in your circle of influence. And man, God has given you an ability just to reach in and love these people and show them what God has taught you. And so you look at these things that you think, you know, just, just disqualify you. And yet, God will use those things. And I've seen it in my own life. The things that I thought couldn't be redeemed, God has used them to be able to empathize with somebody else where they've been. Or say, hey, I've been where you're at. Me too. Sean talked about me too last week. Me too. I, I, know, what, I know what that's like. And when people hear that, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm not alone. Absolutely. And God uses those things to build people. And so we are surrounded again with people that, that God wants to, to bring in. We talk about this all the time. Last week, Pastor Sean talked about belonging before you believe. We love seeing people come in. And we never want to be the church that has that religious list. And yes, you can belong here long before you believe what we believe. Because in these rows, every week, the message of God is going to be proclaimed. And you're going to hear what Jesus believes about you and what he wants for you. And there'll be people here every week, I pray, that at the beginning, they don't believe that. And that's fine. It's not my job to convince them. But God breaks those walls down. And so in these rows, we learn every week what God wants. But we can't stop there. Because we learn in rows, but we grow in circles. Let me say that again. We learn in rows, and you're still isolated a little bit, but we grow in circles. And so you're asking yourself, what do, Barry, what do you mean? What do you mean by a circle? The easiest way that we do it here is something called a life group. And it gives us an ability just to hang out outside of just a gathering on a Sunday. And just get to know each other. Because here, we'll say, hey, how you doing? The Chiefs are doing great, right? The weather is kind of crappy today. Sometimes it, it doesn't ever get any deeper than that. But God's called us to go deeper, to invest in people, to be real, 
It's what we do in real life. We're real vulnerable. And some of us, it's not easy. Much as I don't like speaking up here, I would rather do this all day long than sit there and share some of my stories in a group. Because at that point, you have to be open and honest, right? And maybe some of you guys are that same way. In that group, though, we rely on people and we learn from people. And we're accountable to them. And we're just, we turn into a family. We say it all the time. You come in as a stranger, but you'll leave as a family when you join a life group. It's absolutely true. I was reminded of this not too long ago, just a few weeks ago. There was a, there was a couple that come to our life group. And they've started coming to real life probably in the last six months to, eight, to a year. And it's been awesome just to have a conversation with them during this last semester. And, man, they've been so many places, and, and it relates so much to, to what I've experienced. And so last, you know, about three weeks ago, we were having this conversation across the dinner table. And they were telling me about what they've experienced in church, you know, how God's taught them so many things. And I was able to have that conversation with them back and forth. Man, it was so cool. And I found out, like, her, you know, the family life wasn't always great. You know, there was a lot of dysfunction, a lot of brokenness. And I was like, yeah, me too. I understand that. Well, what I didn't realize was... In the midst of us having this really deep, just locked in conversation, the youth group had gotten out. And so my kids had come home and there was another girl that had, had showed up and just came to hang, hang out and have some dinner or something like that. And she was sitting next to me. I knew it, but I didn't know it. I'm a little obtuse. That's my wife. Sometimes I don't always pay attention, right? <laughs> Guys, we have a problem with that sometimes. So what I didn't realize is she was sitting there listening and I had no idea. And so though I was being blessed and I loved that conversation, God opened this as an opportunity for an impact in somebody's life that I didn't even expect. And man, and after we were we were finished talking, this girl came up, kind of gave me a hug. She's like, "Hey, thank you so much for that." I'm like, "For what? What did I do?" <laughs> Obtuse, right? She's like, "In my family, we never talk about spiritual things like that." And you know, I kind of got emotional because I realized, you know, I mean, that happened to me as well. You know, my family, we went to church, but that's where it stopped. There was no impact. We never talked about the things of God at all. So it was cool to see God in this life group use a relationship that we were forming between me and two other people to impact somebody else I wasn't even aware of. And that will happen all the time for you. I guarantee it. God will use you to impact and build other people. It's the natural consequence of growing in circles. I'm going to pick up Peter's story just real quickly and we'll finish up with him. In John 21... We come back to Peter. So Peter's in, the, in, in a situation right here. The, the, this story is, is that Jesus has already been killed and buried and resurrected. So, man, this is after the victory. And this should be a party, right? And he's sitting there teaching the disciples and the apostles. And you have, you have Peter. Can you imagine being Peter at this time? Yeah, man, this is awesome this happened. But, man, I denied him. I denied Jesus three times. How do you come back from that? How do I build people if I can't even take care of myself? And Jesus knows what's going on. He knows Peter's mindset. So he goes up to Peter and says, you know, and he said this three times. If you read in John 21, 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, catch that. He calls him out by name. Do you love me more than these? And Peter responded, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus said this, feed my lambs. And he went through this three times. And Peter's getting frustrated. But all that comes back to this is that it's kind of mirrored. Jesus mirrored what happened in Peter's rejection of him and denial of him three times. And he was ultimately telling Peter this, hey, that's your past. It's redeemed. It's forgiven. We'll use that. And that's the fuel that Peter had to go throughout the Roman Empire and proclaim the message of Christ and the salvation that he brings to everybody. Can you imagine being in Peter's shoes and saying, man, I screwed up that bad? And yet, it's okay. God's forgiven it. God's going to use this in my life. And we see this all the time. And Sean also referenced this in the welcome. We don't want to build floors to walk over people. We want to build ceilings that way we put people on our shoulders. And that way they can go further and faster than we ever could. Because so many times we want to hold people back. We want to break that relationship up. We want to destroy them. Because they don't meet some sort of criteria that we have in our mind. But God has called us to something bigger. 
And we're called to build them. We're called to build the church. We're called to love people. We're called to invest in them. Not only in the rows, but especially in the circles. I heard an awesome story the other day. And it's about a foster kid. And we have so many families in our church that have been in the foster care system and they've adopted. And my family is one of those lucky ones and we've been able to, to do that as well. So when I heard the story, it kind of, it impacted me because a lot of times when I hear stories about fostering and adoption, it really, it really is reminiscent of how God works in the church because we're taking somebody that's outside of that group and we're bringing them in. And they don't always understand what's going on. And there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of destruction. And if you've ever fostered or if you've ever seen somebody that's done that or somebody's adopted, things aren't always pretty. And that's the way the church is. It's not perfect. Start from the pastor to the back row. We're all messed up at some level. But God calls us and God calls us to, to something better and higher. And so as I heard this story, I was like, absolutely, this is it. And the story is this, is that there was this little kid and he grew up in, in I think Indiana or Ohio somewhere. From the time that he was born, he was rejected in his own family. And every day he would hear, you were a mistake. We don't want you. We don't, you're, you've ruined our lives. And this little kid's name was Isaac. So by the time he was 10, he had heard year after year after year of how worthless that he was. And when you hear something long enough, you believe it, right? You hear that story and he identified with the things that his family had told him. Well, ultimately he was removed from that family just through the years of abuse, the years of neglect. And so he would go to another family and then everything would look cool for a while. Good looking kid, well adjusted it seemed like. And it would look good for about a month, maybe two, at most three. And then these families would start, yeah, I want to adopt this kid. It was, they, would, they, would, they would go through the foster and think, yeah, I want to adopt him. But something would happen somewhere in that timeline, and something would trigger Isaac. And all these feelings of inadequacy and worthlessness would just rush back. And he, he didn't believe that anybody would accept him for who he was. So what, here's what he would do. He would run into the kitchen, or wherever they kept garbage sacks, not garbage sacks, trash bags, like you would get, um, the grocery bags, I'm sorry. He would get grocery bags. And what he would do is he would grab those grocery bags, the paper ones, He'd grab a Sharpie or a pen, and he would start writing the names that he identified with. Garbage, stupid, worthless. And he would write those on the bag, and then he would put the bag on. So then he would just sit there and just sob and moan and rock. And these families that he were in, he would go to, and they'd be like, ooh, who's this kid? This isn't what we signed up for. We're done with him. And that happened with the first family. And then it happened with a second, a third, and a fourth. And he began and just reinforced, man, they don't want me. Everything that I'm saying and I believe about myself is true. Well, finally, he comes to another family. A solid, a solid family. He spent a lot of time in church. So the whole thing plays out again. The first month, good. The second month's good. Somewhere in the middle of the third month, Isaac finds that trigger. Anxiety just shoots through the roof. He's lost. What's his go-to? He goes and finds that trash bag or that, I'm sorry, that grocery bag. He starts writing those names like he has in every other family. He puts that, he just puts that bag over. And so this family though, they sit back and there's, see how this one plays out. Because they've heard that there were some issues here. And so they're sitting there just watching it. And the dad tells the story. He's like, we were watching it. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what was what was going to was going to happen to Isaac next. And this family had two other kids, and one was about the same age as Isaac. He couldn't take it anymore. He stands up and he runs in the kitchen. He goes over to Isaac, rips the bag off of his head. He said, "That is not true. That is not who you are." And we love you and we accept you just the way you are right now. And I heard that story. I thought several things. How many times do we put a bag on our head? How many times do you identify with the things that you've been called in the past? And that's the cool thing about the life groups, about finding community. We are here to rip the bags off of each other's heads. 
And I've heard it said this way, and I just loved it. The pastor said this one time. He said, Satan knows your name. Each person in here, he knows your name. And yet, he calls you by your sin. And that's what we hear. That's how we identify. Man, I'm not, I'm not whatever my name is. I'm this sin. And I'm scared for everybody else to know it. But in this community, we want to reflect what God has. God's sovereign. God's, God's smart. God's wise. He knows your sin. But He calls you by your name. <laughs> That's the blessing. That is the role that we get to play when we build people. Because you're going to be surrounded by people that has, have bags over their heads. You're going to have a bag over your head. Rip it off. You can't live life alone. When you do, I guarantee it will be a life of hell. I think about the times in my life I've made the worst decisions. It's been the times when people have tried to surround me, but I walked away. And I isolated myself. When you put yourself in community, and you put yourself in a group, you surround yourself with people that want the best for you. And they want to pour in you. And they want to love you. And they want to provide leadership. And we do that back and forth. It's a two-way group. So as you guys think about maybe what God's tugging on you to do, this is the part. What's your next little step? And I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I've got some great recommendations for you. God has provided you opportunities here to take that next little step of faith, to find your purpose, to find what your future might be. And I think about life groups. We are launching this semester four or five, I think five life groups that will focus strictly on creating financial margin in your life through Financial Peace University. Man, I don't know how many times I've talked to people like, I can't do anything. I can't help anybody. I can't do what God's called me to do because I'm barely taking care of myself financially. I don't know how I'm gonna make the next car payment. I don't know how I'm gonna buy my kids supplies or even food. So there's an opportunity for you just to come in and say, help. Take, we're gonna help rip that mask off. God has something better for you. Maybe you're in a spot where you're new to faith completely. You don't even know what I'm talking about. You don't even know any spiritual laws, principles, what God. You don't even know who God is, maybe. We're going to have a group that will answer any question you may or may not have there. Because I know that you do. And you're looking for something. What does God have for me? Or maybe you're in a spot where you know that God is calling you to some sort of next level leadership. And we're going to have groups for even something like that. How can you leverage what God has gifted you with just to make a bigger and broader impact? right where you're at. And I know that God's going to call the next set of pastors for the city out of here, worship leaders, but not only that, the next set of teachers, doctors, businessmen. And you're going to impact every circle around here. I really, truly believe that God has that for you. Life groups, check out next steps. Discover your purpose. God has a next little step for you. And again, if you think you're the person like, man, I want to believe that you have a little tug in your heart, I want you to know that little tug is a vision. Be like Peter. You don't have to know the whole path. You don't have to know the whole story to take this first little step. So I'm going to pray for you guys in a minute. Be pretty quick. The worship team's going to come up. We'll have one more song. But as we pray, I want you guys to think about what would it look like just to pursue that vision. Even in the uncertainty of what the future looks like, what does it look like?